Welcome to our talk on resiliency and performance engineering for OpenStack at enterprise scale. We're going to talk a little bit about, yeah, about us. I'm Jason Venner. I'm the chief architect for Mirantis. I have been involved in most of the large-scale enterprise deployments to date. And we have... Hi, everybody. I'm Nathan Streblood, and I've been playing around with distributed systems and distributed systems at scale and uh, enterprise computing for quite a while. So we're excited to be here and tell you a little bit about our experience. Mirantis, as you can see, has a large enterprise customer list. We're also, as part of our enterprise focus, partnering with most of the people who make the equipment that's necessary for enterprise operations. And we are very major contributors to OpenStack. As part of our focus on the enterprise, we've initiated a, a project we call the Wrecking Crew, which is designed, our, our belief is, unless you break it every possible way, you can't build stability. So we've created a crew called the Wrecking Crew to actually break everything so we can deliver you rock-solid OpenStack. We want to improve reliability at scale, demonstrate publicly how to do this, because the more the community understands and the users, the more adoption OpenStack will see. We want to demonstrate real enterprise applications, and we want to push the scale and performance numbers as large as we can and share all of the best practices we learn while we open source everything we do. So we see a lot of the enterprise engagements, and we talk, I talk to a lot of the CIOs and the VPs, and I'm going to see what they're looking for from their perspective. They're looking for cost savings, operational efficiency, an open platform, flexibility and choice, and the ability to innovate and compete. And it has to deliver something they can run their business on, so it has to be rock solid. You know, the typical enterprise person, I need to deploy and manage my apps, I need to help, my ops team has to be able to manage what I'm delivering, everybody has to meet their SLAs, and in most enterprises there's somebody overseeing everything to make sure that they meet some compliance requirements, and have to explain our costs to the CFO, and we have to provide capacity in near real time rather than 16 weeks later, which is the, the norm. We have a lot of material, so I'm going to whip through it until we get to the stuff that's actually interesting. So, Really, enterprise's option is about increasing the velocity of value creation, because every enterprise we know is under some competitive threat, and they need to make a change to compete effectively. So to be successful in an enterprise, you need to think about your technology and you need to think about your culture. Because ultimately, your culture is where the true value will come and the technology needs to enable the cultural changes to let you achieve the high velocity of innovation you're looking for. And we need to plan your... OpenStack clouds don't live in isolation. They have to be part of your environment. They have to integrate into your ecosystem. You need to pick... Sorry. Get rid of that. You need to pick the plugins, because OpenStack is a control plane. You need to pick the SDN plugin, the storage plugins, the compute plugins, and everything else in your environment to fit your workloads and tailor it to your requirements. You also need to pick your hardware, because these things are circular dependencies. And plan for failure, because we're building for a horizontally scaled world where most everything can fail and will. And you have to. Pr for true enterprise reliability, you need to actually fail over on a regular basis because if you don't verify your failover, it's already failed. We're planning for our SLAs. We need to plan for our clusters. Most of the enterprises start with very small clusters and then they take the, they take the deployment plan and the operational policies they built and try to run that on their production clusters and that's not going to work. There's really a very different whole ecosystem around production deployments versus pilots. And we also need to deal with, when we're thinking about this, friendly environments versus things that are exposed to the public internet. And be prepared to tailor your cloud to your workload if you need to. So we're going to talk about hypervisors. We, we live in the KVM world because we're mostly open source, but you know, vCenter is an ideal hypervisor if you're running legacy applications where you want vMotion and all of those lovely attributes for things that 
you can't deal with is horizontally scaled attributes. Containers are ideal for very dense packing and or for very high performance applications. The, the goal with a container hypervisor is that your applications that would normally run on bare metal are part of your SDN environment and part of your storage virtualization. Hyper-V, Microsoft. Once you, the most important thing you're going to have to decide on is your SDN solution for your enterprise application because this will determine how you lay out your physical network topology. And this is really a function of the kind of use cases. If you're really dealing with a public cloud where most of your access is north-south, you will choose one style of SDN. If you're dealing with an application where you have a large numbers of east-west flows in your cloud, you may have another. And the other kind of interesting piece is, ultimately, with SDN, everything about your application deployment and your network infrastructure changes, and it's going to take the people who normally support your networking a while to catch up. And you're going to end up working with them through some very painful moments before they become partners in your success. Mirantis has been a big fan of HA for OpenStack and HA for applications. We pioneered a lot of the HA for OpenStack. Oh, you want to... We're testing failure right now. <laughs> See, failover. We didn't test beforehand. <laughs> we'll switch back. Let's switch back. Okay, yeah. Super. Yeah. You should expect that you're going to be doing cold starts in your environment on a, in a reasonable basis, and at some point. Okay, where we go? Here we go. Your applications need to be horizontally scaled and ultimately spanning multiple failure domains. And if you're running something like where your applications are running behind heat or scalar or some automation infrastructure, they're going to beat the crap out of your control plane and you need to build your control plane to handle the load that they're going to impose. And ultimately, once you're running your production apps on your cloud, you need to do rolling updates and you need sustained failures. And we're, I'm kind of a firm believer that if you have a, a service pool of that you need five servers to provide the function, you need to run seven to provide the capability so you can have one down for maintenance and still have resiliency for a second failure. And that also handles some burst loading. Okay. I was going to talk a lot more. From a storage perspective, Swift is an ideal tool for geo-replicated data. Block storage is still really a very much a local data center operation unless you're using a commercial storage technology that handles the replication. And if you're running high-level production applications, you need storage replication across the geo. The most important thing for enterprise success is recognizing that you're going to be crossing a lot of silos in your environment, and if they're not working as a team, it'll be a disaster. We've already talked about the, the network core, the release management team needs to roll in, your software development, your architects. Who else do we need? Compliance, for Compliance, example. Compliance, yes, and your security and audit. We've been working through this with some of our customers, and sometimes these people come in very late in the game when you've got a, you're getting ready to go live, and the time you have between the time they engage and the time you go live is less than the time they need to actually understand what you're doing so they can make sensible choices, let alone actually come up with a compliance and audit plan. You spend most of your time explaining what you're doing and why it's different. So in many ways, the rest of the organization may not have caught up to the velocity with which we're delivering software and infrastructure, especially at the enterprise. Mm -hmm. So we kind of whipped through that because those are really mom, pop, and apple pie, and we're going to start delving into some of the cultural issues which are much more interesting. Yep. So I want to talk to you a little bit about culture and what it takes to create mission-critical culture uh, within the enterprise and how we need to think about starting to, to change both within the enterprise and also within the OpenStack community what we need to do to deliver mission-critical, rock-solid OpenStack. 
And you know, this is a journey. It's not something we can just flip a switch and deliver. So when we think about mission-critical OpenStack, you know, the question is, how, how can we support this? How can we evolve what we're doing in that direction? So one of the great ways to think about this is, well, let's borrow from other mission-critical situations where you know, we're already familiar and where we already know there's, there's best practices. So you can think about this. I, I put up a, a picture of a 747 cockpit here. There's a ton of switches and gauges and dials on there, and somebody said to me earlier this week, you know, I think there's probably more switches and dials in OpenStack than that. So this doesn't even begin to cover the kind of complexity we're dealing with in OpenStack. So let's look at how some other industries manage complexity, what they've done in their cultures, and, and how they've affected that. So put simply, what do a lot of these things have in common? They have checklists. So how many of you have heard about the checklist manifesto? A couple people. So the Checklist Manifesto was, uh, is a book that was written a couple of years ago by Dr. Atul Gawande, and he was trying to understand why there's so many failures in surgery and in medicine, and, and what can be done. You, know, you go in for an operation, and people end up with complications that really could have been avoided. Uh, people are missing sort of the simple stuff, the easy stuff. So they developed a very simple 19-point checklist that they applied uh, at eight different hospitals when they were going to do surgery. And they're trying to understand, well, if we apply the, something as simple as a checklist, borrowing from these other industries, can that really improve the results and reduce the failure rate in surgery? And quite shockingly, with just a simple checklist uh, at, at, at key points in the process, they dropped complications by 36% and dropped uh, the death rate from those complications by half. It was pretty stunning, and at first, they, they really couldn't quite believe the results. So one thing you might ask, and this happened in the medical field, well, you know, okay, maybe that's surgery, but is, is OpenStack, is it too complex for checklists? So a lot of the doctors rejected the idea, and I think when we think about something as simple as a checklist, and not when you're thinking of operations, we've all had a ton of education, training, worked for years with all this technology, and for someone like me to come along, or this doctor to come along and say, you know what you really need is a simple checklist. Everyone rolls their eyes and says, well, you know, that's not really the answer here. We're dealing with very complex systems, and, and you, know, you can't reduce my job to a checklist. Uh, but my favorite part about his, his study was that when they surveyed the doctors about the effectiveness of checklists, 20% of them said, ah, waste of time, don't need it. Uh, but when they surveyed those same guys and said, well, if you were getting surgery, would you want a checklist? 94%. So everybody wanted a checklist for their surgery, but didn't necessarily think it was, it was the thing for them. So, thankfully, we're not doing surgery. We're, we're, we're building OpenStack and trying to run it in production for the enterprise. So it's not quite a life and death experience, but for uh, many of you who may have been through a service outage at scale, uh, it can feel like a near-death experience if you're involved in it. Uh, and so uh, you know, I think it's worthwhile to think about that as a, as a comparison. So there's lots of ways we can, we can uh, apply checklists in OpenStack. We can apply it uh, at the requirements level. Uh, I experienced this at, at Hadoop when we were running you know, 40,000 servers, 500 petabytes, uh, and you know, we had a lot of development teams coming up with really amazing stuff, and they would come and say, I've got this incredible new service, I want to put it on the production grid, and then our DevOps team would come out and say, well, here's the checklist. Have you thought about your HA strategy? Have you thought about what you're going to do, how we're going to monitor this thing? Have you thought about these, you know, very simple, it's like three or four points. HA, monitoring, upgrade and rollback, you know, pretty basic stuff. But of course, the engineers were so focused on delivering the new service, they weren't really sensitized yet to thinking about what it was going to take to put things into production. And so this is kind of the point I'm trying to make about culture, is that as a community and as people implementing OpenStack in the enterprise, we really need to think about how we create that production-oriented thinking in the enterprise. So there's a bunch of different places we can apply checklists. And actually, I want to go back for, for just a moment and, and cover these. So I mentioned requirements, and I'll get to delve into these in a little more detail. And of course, there's different, different layers at which you can apply checklists. But stages are also a really important place to think about checklists when running things uh, in, uh, at scale. And by stages, I mean pause points. All right, we tried it small, now let's pause 
and see if we've got everything right. Okay, we're running out to our staging cluster. Let's pause before we go to the next step. So there's lots of places where you can think about applying checklists as a way to raise the level of, of production mentality and reduce the failure rate. So you know, I covered you know, some, some examples of, of good pause points when going from an idea to putting something into production. Uh, and you can think of each of these as, as good checkpoints to stop and think and make sure you've, you've done your homework with respect to production. Requirements, I covered those a moment ago. Again, you know, it seems pretty basic. The whole idea here is not to make a huge long list of 100 things that you need to do, but to make sure that all the experts who have this knowledge have stopped for a moment to think, did I cover this before moving on to the next phase? You know, in, the, in the surgery example, it was amazing how many uh, silly things got missed. And a lot of the time in the surgical example, you have incredibly brilliant people faced with very complex situations and a lot of chaos, a lot of different things coming at them. And if this sounds like any of you working in, in production deployments, it's the same thing. And it's when all that chaos is happening that you miss the basics that can really get you into trouble later. So other examples of where you can employ checklists, thinking about what, is, what are you going to do about power, thinking about redundancy in the physical infrastructure, uh, thinking about have I got the topology right, have I verified that all the plumbing is in fact working. So there's ways to think about this both in terms of what you need to, to check, what are the critical points, as well as places where you need to pause before you go to the next stage. And then of course there's all kinds of things within OpenStack itself that you can do to validate that you've got it right. And you know, we're building tooling all of the time uh, to do this. The good news is it's software and we have automation. So a lot of these things we can take care of uh, with tooling. And of course, Jason mentioned earlier, you know, understanding what your use case is and understanding what the SLA expectations are for that use case is another critical place to make sure that you are validating what you're doing, that you're getting the response rates that you're expecting, and that you're constantly revalidating. Yeah, let me interject one thing. OpenStack is a means for an enterprise to run their, provide services to their users. Everything is focused on what do I need to do to provide these services reliably to my users. Everything else is noise. And of course, you know, I'm talking about checklists and, and we're thinking about software and technology, but I think one of the big learnings when we talk about culture and mission critical oriented thinking is that a lot of the time checklists are a way to a forcing function, a way to force communication across the silos that Jason mentioned earlier. So making sure that all the stakeholders before you put something into production have actually communicated and know what's going on. So it's a way to not only force communication but also to create a tighter team of people that are working towards a common goal of delivering something into production. Yeah. An interesting example of that, we were tuning a large cluster for a company and we'd set up all of our tuning parameters and then the DC ops people said, you can't use these tuning set settings because they're going to exceed our floor, pace, floor space power planning. So we had to detune the cluster by about 15% to keep the power utilization within tolerance. Never like a surprising, all your racks going out in the middle of the peak load. Yep, so, so checklists aren't about uh, getting things, getting the, you know, uh, a recipe or getting the easy stuff done. Especially when we're talking about communication, checklists are there to facilitate communication when the inevitable bad things happen. So when the chaos happens and you're having the near-death experience because the cluster is down, because uh, your environment is down, that's where you want to employ checklist to think about, okay, what do we need to go through to make sure we've covered the obvious stuff right. and that we've checked in and made sure the environment is, is rolling the way we expect. So as I said, you know, checklists, when you think about them, they're not recipes. They're not do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. They are telling you not how to do something, but what you need to do and in what order. One of my favorite checklists from the aircraft example was what to do when uh, the, the engine fails on your single engine plane. The very first item on that list, the it's a very short checklist, it's five items, the very first item on it is fly the airplane, which seems kind of ridiculous, but if you think about it, in the chaos of the engine has died, how do I restart it, oh my god, I'm going to die, 
people sort of tend to forget, oh yes, I'm still flying an airplane, perhaps I should do something about that first. How many pilots in the audience? Not many. Yeah, so for the pilots, you guys already know all about what I'm talking about with respect to checklists. So how can we borrow that and apply it to mission-critical OpenStack? Mm -hmm. The other thing about checklists is they aren't a static thing. They're, they're, they are there for continuous, as a tool for continuous improvement and improving communication. Something went wrong, you missed it, update your approach. And the other critical point about checklists is plan for failure more than success. In the aircraft example, there are uh, a couple of checklists that cover the normal situation and, you know, a hundred that cover what to do when something goes wrong. So, you know, it may seem like putting in more work up front to planning what you're going to do in production, but if you do it right and you work across the teams, you're actually going to save yourself time and make this easier and repeatable. You can't afford not to do this. Otherwise, you'll never deliver reliable features to production that stay up and running. So when you think about this, to sort of summarize, you know, today I'm not going to give you a bunch of checklists. As we develop them within Mirantis, as we are developing them, uh, we'll share them publicly. I think you can see a lot of the things, and I'll, I'll give some examples in a minute, where we're applying a checklist mentality to the tooling that we're developing for OpenStack and how mm -hmm. you can do that. But think about what are your checklists? What are the critical areas where this needs to happen? Keep it simple. Like I said before, a checklist is not a to-do list. If it's something that's 100 lines long, everyone is going to ignore this. We live in a very complex, interrupt-driven world. It has to be short. As I said before, consider what are the stages, what are the, what are the key communication points you need to think about when you are putting something into production and it's mission critical. And of course, as wrecking crew, never stop thinking about failures. I said before, plan to fail, fail over, see what happens, make sure you've done that already, and yeah. develop your checklists while you're doing that, not after everyone has had the near-death experience mm -hmm. of having their entire environment fail. So uh, I'm going to change gears in just a second. So if you haven't read it, I only saw one hand out there, read it. It's a really short read. It's really compelling. Uh, I was definitely inspired by it in thinking about how we can deliver mission-critical OpenStack. So check out the guy's book. I think you can read it in about three hours. It's not, it's not super dense. All right, so... We get to some meat finally. Now, yeah, now we're talk a little bit about how we're applying some of this thinking. So, uh, you know, Jason talked quite a bit about considerations you need to make from a technology perspective. And I've been talking quite a bit about what you need to think about from a cultural perspective. So now let's try to put those two things together in some ongoing case studies that we're doing with our partners. I think part of the, the message we want to deliver here to all of you is that uh, delivering mission-critical OpenStack is not something that Mirantis can do on its own. It's not something that any of us can do on its own. Part of the beauty of open source is that it really is going to take an entire community of us to deliver the kind of rock-solid, mission-critical, uh, experience that the enterprise needs. So this is why we're working with partners, uh, working with customers, and we want to work with all of you in how do we raise the production quality, how do we raise OpenStack to be that mission-critical infrastructure that we all want. So talk a little bit about uh, what we were doing with Flextronics. Flextronics worked with us, is, is actually on, uh, working with us on an ongoing basis in their cloud labs. And so some of the questions we wanted to understand is, well, with the current state of tooling and with what's out there, uh, what's the experience of trying to uh, configure and deploy uh, mission-critical OpenStack at the scale of about 60 nodes? So the idea was to, to walk through a complete deployment with the current, current tooling, configure for HA, configure for, for mission-critical operation, and, and see what that experience is like and where we see some, some, uh, some gaps. And this was largely him, one of our product managers, doing it, not the core guys that we send out to the customer sites to tackle anything. Yeah, so I had the uh, advantage or disadvantage, I suppose, of not having the same technical depth, at, say, as Jason, uh, and knowing where, you know, where all the, the, the gray areas are uh, in OpenStack when deploying for something at production. So what did we deploy? Uh, a little bit of a drift there. So uh, Flextronics was kind enough to provide uh, 54 nodes of their Wolfpack 1U computes. Uh, we deployed those onto a couple of racks. 
Um, we also used six nodes of their uh, Kenya 2U storage units. Um, we had a lot of switches in there. We had 10 edge core switches, five per rack. Um, and the idea here was this is not, not unlike what, uh, maybe not large scale yet, but not unlike what customers are deploying today. Bit of a spaghetti diagram, but this is just to show. So we had uh, uh, two racks, as I said, 10 switches, uh, five networks. We deployed all of this according to Morant's uh, you know, reference architecture for networking as well as, as for the underlying infrastructure. And uh, just briefly, you know, we had a network for, the, uh, for Pixie booting, a network for public VM uh, IPs, as well as uh, 10 gig networks for management, for the private east-west networking, and of course, 10 gig network for storage as well. As I mentioned, we deployed all of this based on our reference architecture. Uh, and uh, we'll make these available later. I know this is a, definitely an eye chart for all of you in the audience. But it's to represent, again, a little bit of checklist thinking. We, we worked hard to think through the physical infrastructure of the network, the logical infrastructure of the network, and so forth. And, and for this particular example, uh, we deployed a Neutron VLAN. So the software components that were involved, we deployed OpenStack Icehouse. Uh, we did the deployment using, uh, using Fuel. We also deployed some additional capabilities, like we used Zabbix uh, for monitoring the infrastructure. Uh, we've deployed uh, Rally for, for test and benchmarking against the cluster. Uh, we used Ceph for block and object storage on the storage nodes in the cluster. And then on top of that, we also used Sahara, uh, or at least this is our, our first dab at this, is using Sahara uh, to generate workloads on the cluster. Um, I th today, a lot of the workload generation that's out there is, is still in the early days. Uh, and so spinning up and spinning down a VM is not necessarily simulating a real-world real world workload. Yeah. So we used Sahara and used a Hadoop workload as something to, to generate a workload. It looks, looks a little bit more like uh, what you would expect. Sahara is Hadoop as a service, for those who are not familiar, it lets you deploy Hadoop clusters in VMs very quickly and easily. So what did we learn in going through this experience of standing up the cluster and doing some of this benchmarking? So and this is, uh, I kind of think of this as food for checklists for later, right? So we started small. So we didn't throw for the touchdown, use a sports analogy. We didn't try to stand the entire thing up, make it all work in the first shot. Uh, well, truth be told, we did try that, but it failed miserably. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, we all do this. We're like, oh, it'll be fine. And then Two days later of moving two, cables yeah, around. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so this leads to the next bullet point, which is debug the physical infrastructure. Now, again, some of this is sort of motherhood and apple pie, but can't uh, stress enough the importance of making sure you've got this right before you move on to the next step. Right. So we liken it to the leaning tower of Pisa. If you want to build an upright structure, you have to verify each floor before you build the next one. That's right. And, you know, and some of this uh, is, is slightly different thinking from what you're doing in a development uh, environment where you know, typically the deployment may be smaller and the environment you're working in uh, you know, may not have the same kind of requirements. So once we got the physical infrastructure solid and we verified it, then we started layering in more of the complexity. So I mentioned we used Neutron VLAN, but before we tried to troubleshoot all of the switch configuration, we started with GRE. Right. Much simpler. Just a way for us to verify all the plumbing before we layered on additional uh, complexity. Then once we had all that going, then we could confirm the health of OpenStack. And if you remember, I mentioned that uh, a lot of the sort of checklist thinking we have an opportunity to, to create through automation. So uh, Fuel, for example, once you've deployed an environment, uh, will then allow you to, uh, to run a complete health check of the environment. And so here's an example where we're using automation to run through a set of steps to confirm the health of the environment before you go on to the next step. And then lastly, or not lastly, but then once all of that is good to go, so health check, we run rally to benchmark the environment, make sure things are, are working properly. Now we have a cloud, now we have infrastructure. But we're still not done yet. We need to verify when we spin up VMs that they're performing as we expect. Is the hypervisor performing the way we expect? Uh, Jason has a set of tools that he's written. 
and uh, it's not this particular example, it's not rocket science, but writing scripts to go ahead and generate VMs, generate traffic between VMs, uh, is another way to make sure that you, you're, you're sort of checking things off in the environment as right. you go before you're going to say, yeah, this is, this is production ready, it's mission critical. And then, of course, we started simulating workloads with, uh, with Hadoop as a service using Terrasort as something that you can use to generate a lot of traffic on the network. Uh, there's also something called Hadoop High Bench, which is another tool you can use Terrasort as a part of it, as a way to just put some stress on your infrastructure uh, at the application level. Mm -hmm. And then once all that was going, then it was a matter of, okay, now it's time to confirm the high availability of what we're doing. So let's go ahead and start failing services. You know, we deployed our controllers in HA configuration. So let's start, let's simulate failure, start shooting services, start shooting controllers, and verify that things continue as expected. Yeah. So I mentioned, you know, health check. Uh, after we deployed for HA configuration, we needed to make sure that the environment is configured the way we wanted, that everything was configured for, for HA, and then we could simulate component failure. So we started this journey uh, of, of confirming resiliency uh, using the human chaos monkey, uh, me and Jason, killing things ourselves. Uh, but again, you know, going through, uh, killing off key services, verifying that they're working, all of these become food for checklists and food for automation for later. Right. So for the moment, we're, we're using, uh, we were using physical chaos monkey, but in the future, perhaps the chaos gorilla is something that we can take up within the OpenStack community. I know there are a few projects I've seen out there that are exploring the use of the actual Netflix chaos monkey as a way to simulate failure, to, cr to cause chaos in the infrastructure mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis. So if you think about what chaos monkey is doing, it's really trying to cover all those failure scenarios and automate them. So I mentioned earlier the aircraft example of, well, normal scenarios, maybe there's one or two checklists. All the failure ones, maybe there's hundreds of scenarios we need to think about and have a set of checklists we go mm -hmm. through. You can do, we can do all of that if we can start to build up uh, automated you know, chaos gorilla or whatever we decide to, uh, right. to call it. And we'd, you know, we'd love yeah. to chat with some of you about uh, work you may be doing in that area or interest in, in participating and yes. helping we us. We will continue as we go further along to publish these as they evolve. So uh, I'll switch over to Jason who did. So uh, I want to thank Flextronics for their ongoing participation with us in providing the environment and the expertise as we do this together. Again, I said we can't do this alone. It takes a community. Uh, and so we appreciate Flextronics. We also worked quite a bit with Big Switch, and J Jason can talk a little bit right. about that. So Big Switch had a 16-rack configuration, which was a nice, large OpenStack environment for us to play in. And we ran TerraSort on a 75-node Hadoop cluster we provisioned through Sahara. And, after, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the details, but the baseline with everything working perfectly we running the, the Terrasort was running in about seven minutes, 22 seconds. And then Big Switch started simulating failures of the spine switches, the core switches, across the cluster during the run, which ultimately networking is the heart of your OpenStack cluster. If your networking is unstable, forget it. You can just go home. And there, the application didn't even notice that they were making failures across the cluster. And this happened with a background load of about 42,000 VMs on the cluster. So it was a quite exciting result, and we're looking forward to publishing some more results. The very interesting thing that came out from this is this cluster had a mix of server types for the hypervisors, and we didn't really think about that. You know, we think a flavor is a flavor is a flavor. All, all M1 smalls or M1 tinies or M1 larges are exactly the same, and they were, in fact, exactly not. And we couldn't, it took us a day or so to figure out why we had a 3x variation in the run the run times. And we used a small tool from a company, a little startup called Megafind, which let us run a very quick infrastructure analytics on any given VM. And we saw that we had over a factor of two variants within the flavors, depending on the hypervisor. So once we reran the jobs all on the appropriate CPU cycle, we had very stable time. So it was very nice. Another example of food for checklists. So by, by running this tool and running the analytics against the infrastructure, uh, you're able to anticipate 
problems yeah. beforehand. Right. I, up until this, I would run Sysbench and a few other things across all of the hypervisors, and I'd normally expect quite a spread in performance, but I didn't have any quick and easy way to, to run this across the set. So, let me throw in one more story. My friend David from Symantec is here. We deployed a, they have a fairly large cluster and we deploy at the rack level. They deploy at the rack level, and we built an extensive, they, in combination, we did a lot of work with them, built a very extensive rack level validator as part of our checklist, where when a, a switch discovery happens in the spine, the tor is booted with a bootstrap image, we power on the boxes, and we actually validate through looking at the DHCP and the MAC ports of the servers, the switch port, the cabling plan, we bootstrap an image on every server, and, and we verify the full cabling plan and burn in the entire rack before we release it for use in the OpenStack cloud or some other purpose. And having that baseline means that everything else is simpler because we know that that floor is solid. So there's a birds of a feather, feather session for the enterprise, 11 a.m. room 241. There is the OpenStack for the win the enterprise mailing list. If you're interested in participating with the Wrecking Crew, you can mail Amitabh Shah, and uh, we'll produce further updates on the blog at Marantis. And of course, you can also come talk to us, because as I, we've been saying all along, we can't do this alone. It's critically important to OpenStack. So. Right, this is a community effort. We hope to actually at some point have a large-scale performance and scale testing lab that people can gate things through. It uses a CI gate. And of course, there's a lot more talks uh, that sort of fit within what we're thinking about within the wrecking crew. Uh, I know it's another bit of an eye chart, but uh, you know, please. Oop. Oop, what happened? I don't know what happened. Um, Maybe they pulled out the hook. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, a uh, lot more talks here at the summit uh, in this same vein. So please, please go check them out. And thank you. I'll put this uh, put this slide back up there in case some of you want to. Looks Take like note. we have a couple of minutes for any questions. All right, well then if, you, uh, if any of you are interested in helping or want to learn more, come see Jason and myself uh, after the talk. Thanks a lot for your attention and uh, we'll see you at the rest of the summit. Hope everyone has a great summit. Thank you.